And uh, we're looking at something that is incredible. When you stop and think about the book of Psalms, the first thing you think about is praising God. Now, I want you to understand before I read this psalm, it's Psalm 100, there's five verses. This psalm is not about praising God, although it says praise Him in it. But we need to understand that most psalms, if you read them, we kind of gather from reading them that it's nothing but praise. But that isn't true. The book of Psalms is filled with great knowledge and great power. And every, every emotion known to man is found in the book of Psalms. That's why music is so powerful. And we're going to look at some things tonight that will help you understand uh, God giving us instruction to praise Him. You find the intensity, it intensifies from Psalm 100 to 150, it's almost to the end of Psalm 150, it's almost all, praise Him, praise Him, praise Him. But I want to talk to you about what Psalm 100 is. It is a worship psalm. It is not a praise psalm. Although praise is mentioned, it is a worship psalm. It is how God expects us to approach Him in worship. So I want you to stand with me and turn in your Bibles to the middle of your Bible, the book of Psalm. We're going to read five verses. Then I'm going to share some things with you that will help you understand. I'm sure you've read Psalm 100 and you've thought, wow, this is just about praising God. But I want to make some observations, verse 1 through 5. How many you found it? Say amen. There's five verses, so God's given us a high five here. It says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye lands, or all nations. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We're not self-made men or self-made women. If you are, you're pitiful. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into its gates with thanksgiving and into its courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. I want to hear someone shout, all generations. generations. We're going to hook into that toward the end of the message, but I want to talk about a worship psalm. You may be seated. Just reading these five verses, we think, well, it's just talking about praising God. (coughs) But we need to understand that some psalms is about serving God. Some of the psalms is about Him, about God. Some of the psalms is about His mighty works. Some psalms is about our feeling and our weaknesses, our disappointments. Some psalms is about worship. Other psalms is about judgment. Some psalms is about prophecy, and other psalms is about repentance. Some psalms is about God's Word, and some psalms is about our fears and our depressions. Some psalms is about angels and prophets. Other psalms is about rejoicing. Some psalms is about help in trouble, and some psalms is about justice and mercy. There are many topics and many themes of the book of Psalms. But the one thing that we need to understand as we approach this Psalm 100, and it is a powerful psalm, it's about worshiping God. I used to always think it was about praising God. Well, you say, isn't praising God worship? Yes. But you just don't break into the king's chamber With a loud voice, you've got to enter in with worship. And it's important that we understand that. 
that we enter in with worship, that we learn to worship the Lord and praise God in the spirit of meekness, in the spirit of hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God. Let me stop and say something about praising God. When you get to Psalm 150, it's almost praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him, because it intensifies. Now, I used to have a little bit of problem with why is God demanding that we praise him? I'm thinking, you know, if I, if I demanded that you always complimented me every time we came in, you'd say there's something terribly wrong with the pastor. He's got an ego that needs to go to intensive care. <laughs> Hello. So God, when you, when you read it and it looks like it's a command that you praise God, I need you to understand something about this praise. When the scripture intensifies that we praise God, he's not on an ego trip. He doesn't want everybody to get on their knees, praise God, praise God, praise God. God's not that, God's not that way at all. What God is doing is he's inviting us to, in, to join in and the praises of the universe toward God. He's inviting us to come and join the heavenly choir. He's inviting us to join the, the, the seraphims and the cherubims crying, holy, holy, holy day and night. He's inviting us to join with the heavenly choir and the Hundreds of millions of people gathered on the sea of glass and they're worshiping God and it's slapping back like uh, claps of thunder back and forth to the universe, praising God, worshiping God. And God is not demanding praise out of you. God's saying you can join in. You can be a part of this and I want you to be a part of the praising the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to have a part in praising God. I hope that answered a little bit of your thoughts for a minute about praising God. By the way, b before I go any further, I want to say I re really did like that drummer tonight. <laughs> Amen. I really enjoyed that drumming. Amen. That boy can do just about anything. I get on them drums on oh my. And I enjoyed the special singing tonight. It's been awesome. We read this, serve the Lord, come into his presence with singing. And someone says, well, why do you sing when you come to church? That's what we're doing. We're coming into his presence. We come before his presence with singing. Now, the Bible doesn't say we come into his presence with singing. It says we come before his presence with singing. In other words, you approach God with a song. You approach God with a merry heart. You approach God with a song on your lips and praise unto the Lord. That's why we sing at the beginning of the service. That's why we worship God. That's why we sing, because you're getting ready to face your pastor a few minutes later. <laughs> Amen. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine before the preacher gets up. But Psalm 100 is a... a Actually, this Psalm 100 is exhorting us to lay aside everything and worship God. That's what this Psalm is telling us to do. Lay aside everything and worship God. Now, that's not for God's sake. That's for your sake. Verse 1 and 2 says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Well, I don't know about you, but if you can make a noise unto the Lord in, a, in just a second or two, I got a problem with your noise. When you make something, it takes some time because you're creating something special. When my wife makes a cake, she has to drop everything she's doing just to make that cake. Hello? She can't stop in the middle of that cake and run out and take care of the chickens because I'll find a feather in the icing in the cake. When you decide to do something, you need to concentrate on what you're doing. Yes. And when the scripture says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, it means a deliberate building up of your soul to worship God. 
to lift up your spirits to worship God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Chris mentioned in his prayer earlier, Lord, my heart is open and my mouth is open to you. Now, I don't want to get the cart before the horse, but I want to say this. There's a lot of people that they're, they're just mouth. They're all mouth. All mouth. You say, what would be an all mouth? Well, my, I've got some guppies in my aquarium that's all mouth. They eat, and you can almost hear them grunting like little pigs in the, in the water. They, they're all mouth. And there's people, and I hesitate to say this, but there are people in churches that they're just mouth. But God wants your heart to be connected to your mouth. And I love that prayer that Chris mentioned, that my mouth is open. My heart is open unto the Lord. And that psalm is talking about our mouths being open and our heart being open. It says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Now, the reason you come before his presence with singing Because you can't get into his presence until you come before his presence with singing. See, the thing that we have going here is we think that the singing is what brings the presence of God in. No, it's not that at all. We sing because the presence of God is here. It's not that God breaks into us. It's that you break into him. Hello? Hello? Woo! It's not that God breaks in on us. We can break into him. We come into his presence with worship and praise. And, and this psalm is telling us, exhorting us, that we stop everything we're doing and we worship the Lord. I think that's so important. Verse 3 and 4 talks about open hearts and open mouths unto God we must have. See, when we open our mouth to God, We open our heart, we open our mouth to God, we are asking him to come. And at the same time, we are coming or we are going to him. Amen? You know, a a child in a back room, as long as that child, if that child's too super quiet, the parents will go find out what he's doing or she But a child that's out playing in the yard or whatever, if they really need help, their little heart and their voice is going to lift up and mama will come running. Daddy will come running. God wants us to open our heart and our mouth to God. Church isn't about just listening. Church is about worshiping God. Church isn't just about hearing God's word. Church is about doing and receiving and loving and honoring God's word. Amen? I think it's an important blessing that we understand that God's agenda is to meet with us. And that ought to be your agenda to meet with God. How many in this room want to meet with God? I do. Amen? I want to meet with God. We raise our voices to draw God. Hello, you say that's not Bible. It's not. What does what does uh, James four eight say? Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. So when we open our mouths with our heart, crying out to God, worshiping God. We draw him. Isn't that beautiful? And we go before his presence with thanksgiving. We enter into the presence of the Lord with thanksgiving. Now, let me give you just a little thought that that blessed my heart. The temple was surrounded by a wall. And the only way into that temple was through a gate. You had to penetrate that wall in order to get into the presence of God. You have a wall, and you have to penetrate that wall in order to get into the presence of God. We come before his presence with singing. Why? Because we're wanting to get in. Amen? We come to church and worship God. We praise God because we're wanting to get in. 
And you say, well, we don't have no walls. Oh, yes, you do. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. We have walls in our mind. We come to church and we have trouble in our heart. We have burdens on our heart. We, we, we're confused. We're troubled. We're, we're under stress. And God is simply saying to us, when you come to me, break into the wall. Not, you know, by, by irreverency, but go through the gate. Break through the wall. Because when you break through the wall, through the gate, you enter into the very presence of God. Some of us need to break down the walls. Amen? Some folks are too afraid about someone seeing them raise your hand. You can't break down the wall because you're afraid someone will see you raise your hand. Hello? Well, if I raise my hand, somebody will see it. Yeah, that's how that works. We raise our hands to the Lord because God wants everybody in the room to see that you are not ashamed to worship the Lord. You say, well, you say, well, do I have to raise my hand to worship the Lord? No, but you're going to be uncomfortable if that one you're sitting beside does. Amen. Hello. So I think that's silly. Do you really? A baby raises its hand because it wants mommy or daddy to pick it up. If a guy gets robbed in a back alley somewhere, he raises his hand so he don't get a bullet in his gut. It's submission. It's surrender. It's also wanting God to come. Amen. Draw nigh to God and he will what? Draw nigh to you. God is waiting on you. Amen. He's waiting on you to open your heart and your mouth to him. We raise our voices to draw him because God's agenda is to meet with us. We draw nigh to God. He draws nigh, he draws nigh to us. Let me simply say this. When we open our hearts and our mouths to God, we need to realize that our heart is what believes and trusts. Notice it says in verse uh, 3, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. Isn't that good? Know ye. There's something you're, you're, you are supposed to know. That God is God. Amen. That's the thing that you and I must know. When we walk into this room and worship God, we must know that God is God. And it, it is he that made us. He's got every answer for our life. He made us and not we ourselves. We cannot take care of our own problems. We cannot be a self-made man. We cannot be a self-made woman. And by the way, you can't transition from a woman to a man either or a man to a woman. I've seen that transition. It is disgusting. Amen. Hello. Well, this is Sunday night. I might as well just shuck the corn. Amen. Amen. I used to be afraid to I used to be afraid to shuck the corn for fear that some of my members would make um, corn liquor out of it. But anyway, <laughs> but the Bible says that we are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Hebrews eleven six says, "Without faith, it is impossible to please Him, for they that come to God must believe that He He is." There it is. They that come to God must believe that he is. Notice it says, know ye that the Lord, he is God. They that come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. God is a rewarder of them that will lift their voice to him, cry out to him, and beseech him and pursue him. We need some folks that will pursue God. There are way too many people going to uh, meetings wanting God to pursue them when God wants you to pursue him. Hello. There are way too many people that, that they, they want to jump at every sound of a possibility of God moving, and they want God to pursue them. But God wants you to pursue him. God wants you to come through the gate with thanksgiving. And did you know thanksgiving is what gives you access through that wall? We thank God. When you think about how good God is to you. Isn't that good? 
When you think about how good God, the Bible says we come before his presence with singing. And it says we enter into his gates with what? Thanksgiving, verse 4. We enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts, there's the word, praise. But thanksgiving comes first. Hello. Be ye thankful unto him and bless his name. So I see that thanksgiving comes first, praise comes second, and thanksgiving comes again. God wants people to be thankful in their heart unto the Lord. So when we come to that wall, we be thankful unto the Lord. I want to say Jesus is my greatest reason for being thankful. Woo! Jesus is my greatest reason for being thankful. I'm thankful for the air I breathe. I'm thankful for the food I eat. I'm thankful for the clothes on my back. I'm thankful for the roof over my head. I'm thankful for the beauty of earth. I'm thankful for the goodness of God. I'm thankful for the blessings of God. But when it comes down to the, to, to, down to the fine, beautiful, uh, glowing point of God's mercy, I am thankful that God so loved me, that God gave his son Jesus Christ to die for me. I am so thankful that Jesus Christ brought mercy to my soul. Come to give me eternal life. I am thankful for Jesus Christ. I am thankful for his blood. I am thankful for his death. I am thankful for his resurrection. I am thankful for his mighty power. I am thankful for his mercy. I am thankful for his forgiveness. I am thankful for his finished work on the cross of Calvary. I am thankful for his resurrection. I am thankful for his ascension. I am thankful for his soon coming to take us home home to be with him. I am thankful, 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 thankful for Jesus Christ. Woo! Boy, when you do that, you can get into the presence of the Lord. Amen? Look at verse 5. I love this. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. I want to say right here that one of the, I think one of the bad indictments, one of the indictments on the church is we, we want to praise God, we want to sing, we, we want to come and hear the preaching of God's word. But way too many of us are living a life of unthankfulness. We're not thankful. We need to be thankful for everything that God's given us. See, we get, we get sideways if things don't go our way. We think, well, God must not like me. I got news for you. If God didn't like you, you wouldn't be here. Hello? Well, then, well, you know, my brother has it made. You know, my brother, he does well. But look at me, I'm being cheated. Yeah, you are envious of what someone else has received in blessing. Let me say to every one of us, you better thank God you're not burning and charred, burnt over wrath of God sitting there. You better thank God that God has been good to you. God has been merciful to you. God loves you and God cares for you. But it's easy for us to think, well, I went to church and things didn't work out for me. Or I, I, you know, I serve God and, and someone that don't serve God, they, they make more money, they have more blessings. Let me tell you, friends, we need to stop right there, stop our complaining and say, be thankful that Jesus Christ is our Savior and be thankful that we're going to heaven. Be thankful that we've been washed in the blood of Christ and one day we will go up into heaven like a rocket in the presence of God, changed in a glorified body and we need to quit murmuring or complaining or feeling bad about our situation, we need to enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! They asked some old people what they would do if they had to live their life over again. What would they change if they had to live life over again? They asked Thousands and thousands of old people. You know, old people like Jimmy, old people like Don, old people like Chris. 
Chris was a young guy when he first started coming to our church. He actually looked pretty good, but he's pitiful now. I'm just teasing. One day, Chris was sitting about three chairs back, about three, da- three chairs back, and I was, showing a, I was showing how people need to be on life support. Remember me, I remember I grabbed Chris, I, I went down there where Chris was, I grabbed him and dragged him out of his chair. I laid him on the floor and I began to show CPR, pumping his chest. And Chris was looking up like me, looking at looking up at me like, what are you doing to me? <laughs> I didn't give him mouth to mouth. I'm not that stupid. <laughs> He'd have dug a hole in the floor, and it's made out of concrete. <laughs> but to ask older people, what would they do if they had to live life over again? And, you know, you're lying if you say, well, I wouldn't change a thing. Truth is, you would change some things. If you could live your life over, I'd have, that's just a pious excuse. Well, I wouldn't change a thing. Well, I would. I got stung by a wasp nest, and about 100 yellow jackets got my back. I changed that. Amen. Hello. Are you listening to me? There are some things you would change. But to ask an older person, what would you do? And to ask thousands of older people, what would, what's the one thing that you would do? And here's what they said. The one thing that we would do, this is the majority of the older people, is we would do more things that will outlast me. I would do more things that outlast me. We need to do more things that will outlast us. What are those things that will outlast us? Well, it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a love for Christ. What are those things that will outlast us? It's a good testimony, a good reputation when we're gone. Amen? What are those things that will outlast us? You can do things and invest in other people's lives, and you can worship God. See, I learned a great truth a long time ago, that my prayers are being bottled up in heaven I learned a great truth a long time ago. Not only is my tears recorded and bottled up in heaven, my prayers are there. And I don't even remember the things I prayed 20 years ago. Shoot, some of you have to ask, did we pray over our food yet? I mean, you prayed over your food one minute ago, and you're saying, did we pray over our food yet? You say, how do you know that? I sit at that table. But our prayers are sent up to God. You understand your prayer is everlasting. Your prayer doesn't die. And you send up prayers to God. And I want you to know when we send up worship to God and we send up praise to the Lord, all that praise, and you find this in the book of Revelation, all that praise, all that worship that we send up to God is gathered around the throne of God, around the sea of glass, and all of our praises are gathering there just waiting for you and I to get home. Isn't that wonderful? You know, I'd love, and I will in the future, catch up with my praise and worship. I'll be there. I send a lot of prayers to the Lord. A lot of cries out to the Lord. I've sent a lot of things. And as I said Wednesday night, uh, you know, preachers get up and say, bless God, you'll be down in the back 40, bunch of chiggers in heaven, and there'll, there'll be an old log cabin there slapped together with a few two-by-fours and a leaky roof and a hole in the porch because that, all you sent ahead was just warped lumber. All you sent ahead, listen to, them, listen to me, that is nonsense. We're all going to be equally blessed and equally happy, but the truth is we will not all be equally rewarded. And our prayers are sent up. So let me just give you a stirring right now. I hope, I, I hope you've been stirred already. This Psalm 100 is a worship song. 
It's worship. You say, well, I thought it was a praise song. No, it's a worship song because it tells us what to do. Let's look at it again as I come to a conclusion. This is a worship song. And I want to show you why I believe it's a worship song. Look at Psalm 100 again with me. And let's just walk through it. Psalm 100, just walking through it. Make, create a joyful noise, not for you, not for those around you, but a pleasant atmosphere for the Lord. Do you see that? Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And that includes everybody. Everybody's included. Serve the Lord. Did you know worship is also serving God? Serve the Lord with gladness. Don't serve him with sadness or anger. Serve him with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Come into the presence of God with singing. But come in the presence of God with knowledge, with who God is. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Then it says, enter. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. There's a time to shout and praise God after you get into the presence of the Lord. There's a time to shout and praise God after you get into the presence of the Lord. A time after you get into his courts, that's the time to praise God. Some people are praising God outside the court. And the angel is saying, listen to that crazy, insane person out there. He's not even in the presence of God. He's just making noise. But when you get into the presence of God and real praise begins to pulsate in your heart, after you've entered into the gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise, be thankful unto him and bless his name. I want to say that when we, the quickest way to get into the presence of God is sing with a joyful heart, and to enter into those walls, and of course there's a gate, Jesus is a gate. We go through that wall with thanksgiving. Isn't that beautiful? And you have walls. I have walls. Some of you came into this church and you were all walled up, I can tell. Some folks come into this church and you got walls up. Sometimes they're worry walls. Sometimes they're stressed out walls. Sometimes there's fearful walls. Sometimes there's past walls. You can, can't get past your past. Sometimes there's walls that are around you, uh, agitation or depression or discouragement. You let walls get You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And around the temple was walls. And the gate was there for the worshipers to go through with thanksgiving. And we need to go into the presence of God with thanksgiving. If you really want God to do something dynamic in your life, you need to stop and start thanking the Lord for all his blessings, all his goodness, all his mercy. And the greatest thing that I can think of to thank God for is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, to thank him for his forgiveness, to thank him for what he did. You see, worship, after all, is all about sitting at his feet. Worship is all about focusing around the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Worship is all about on the sea of glass, bowing before the lamb that was slain for our sins. Worship is all about gathering around the ultimate sovereign God of the universe gathering around Jesus Christ, worshiping Jesus Christ, magnifying Jesus Christ, giving glory to God for Jesus Christ, loving Jesus Christ, getting together and praising Jesus Christ. And when people in the church start praising Jesus Christ and start worshiping Jesus Christ and start giving their hearts to Jesus Christ and giving thanksgiving to God for Jesus Christ. Have you noticed how many times Paul said in his letter, 
sinners, uh, giving thanks for you in Jesus Christ. You notice how many times did I give thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior who bought me, cleansed me, washed me. Have you ever noticed how many times the, the prophets and the preachers and the uh, Peter and the apostles said, we give thanks to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. May grace and peace be multiplied to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever noticed we get together in Jesus Christ's name for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved and Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life and no man comes before the Father but through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I love it, don't you? You see, if we focus on Jesus, then the whole church gets in one accord. Because Jesus is the one thing that can get stick toism on everybody. You say stick toism is not a word. It is now. Jesus is our stick toism. When you gather in Jesus' name, music's better. When you gather in Jesus' name, praise makes sense. When you gather in Jesus' name, lives are changed. When you gather in Jesus' name, he'll be there. Because he said, if two or three gather together in my name, there will I be in the presence of them. When you gather in Jesus' name, there's a unity among us. There's a joy among us. There's a praise God among us. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. I used to play baseball. And the number one object of baseball was the baseball. Write that down. That's the reason they call it baseball. Because the number one object of baseball is the baseball. They take a bat to hit the baseball. They take a glove to catch the baseball. They knock the baseball over the fence for home run. They take the baseball and throw it to first baseman to throw someone out. It's the baseball. It's all about the baseball. And when I was growing up, the outfielders, when the, when the ball was hit up in the air, there's one thing that brought us all together was the baseball. And when third baseman, the hitter knocks it up to the left field, it goes high. Third baseman backs off the base. The third baseman or the uh, third outfielder, the outfielder left field comes in. The third baseman goes out. The, uh, the uh, outfielder comes in. The second baseman goes over. The shortstop closes in. And one thing you always say is, I got it. I got it. And that meant everybody Back off, I've got the ball. But if they don't hear you say, I got it, I got it, you're going to get it. <laughs> because the outfielder, the third baseman, the shortstop, the second baseman, and sometimes even the center fielder all connects Boom, knocks heads together, falls in the, uh, uh, in the outfield, and there, there, they all got splitting headaches and the ball sitting there doing nothing. Amen? But living for Jesus isn't baseball. But we need to understand that Jesus is what brings us together. Amen? And everybody ought to shout, I got it. I got it. I got it. Come on, shout it. I got it. Come on, shout it. I got it. See, when you get it, people will leave you alone. When you get it, they'll know you got it. Amen? I got it. I know in whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that uh, against that day. He, he saves me. I am persuaded. Uh, greater is he that's in me than he is in the world. Uh, I know that he which has begun a good work in me will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Why? Because I got it. 
I got it. And when you get people together in church and they've got it, and they've got the praise, they've got the worship, they've got the Lord Jesus Christ, they magnify God, and we yield out of courtesy worshiping God, I want you to know the main attraction in this church is not the preacher, it's not the song leader, it's not the singer, it's not the school teacher, it's not the Sunday school teacher, it's not the usher, and it's not you, it's Jesus Christ. He's the main attraction in this church. Woo! But when you got someone saying, I got it, and everybody else wants to get it, and everybody else wants to be that one to save the day, then we're no longer worshiping together as a team. We're competing with each other. And we can't compete with each other. Amen? We've got to worship the Lord. We've got to magnify God. We can't compete with each other. We've got to walk together, love together. And that's what Psalm is about, the Psalm 100. It's about worship. It's about worship. It's not just about praise. It's about worship. It's about gathering and singing. It's about gathering and honoring God. It's about giving our all to Jesus Christ. It's about focusing on the Son of God. It's about worship. And when we worship, I'm going to give the church a challenge. You're going to think I'm crazy. I've got news for you. I am. But you're going to think I'm crazier than crazy, and I am. You're going to think I'm lunatic, and I am. You're going to think I've been bitten by some wild, far-out mentality, and I probably have been bitten. His name is Jesus, the Holy Ghost. But let me give you a little challenge. Our next church service can be totally changed if everybody in this room would gather together and focus on nothing but worshiping Him. This whole church would be transformed in one service if everybody would focus on Him and worship Him. Amen? Hello? Worship Him. Amen? We need to worship the Lord. We need to worship the Lord. On, um, on the uh, Palm Sunday, before Easter, we're going to have the table spread. We're going to have all the different symbols of the Old Testament and New Testament. And we're going to get together and we're going to have homemade, heaven-made, homemade, uh, unleavened bread. We're going to have... Uh, the real thing. We're going to have our fruit of the vine. We're going to have all the, the, the beauty of trimmings of the Lord's Supper. And, and not only that, the Lord's Feast and the Feast of Tabernacle. We're going to have all that here on, on Palm Sunday. And we're going, to, we're going to worship the Lord before Easter. And when we give the message, we'll gather around that table and we'll all just worship the Lord. We'll all just worship the Lord. Do you know we could do that every service? We could do that every service. But we just focus on Jesus. Amen? I got so blessed with Dale being baptized this morning. When he come up out of the water, he was glowing like he was plugged into a socket somewhere. <laughs> he was glowing. He come up out of the water and he had a shine on him. And he was waving to people. That's an awesome you know why he feels that way? You know why he was so happy? Because he obeyed the Lord. Amen? And everybody's so happy. We need to just serve the Lord with gladness. I'm going to give an invitation. I'm going to invite you to come down here to an altar and just ask the Lord for his help that you would thank God. Thank God. See, see, most of you are, I, I'm going to assume that all of you are going to go home tonight, and sometime tonight you're going to slip into a nice warm bed, and you're going to slip nice warm covers over you, and you're going to enjoy a bed. When there are people out there living in a cardboard box, there are people in third world countries that are laying on the ground, and many times those people 
out there laying on the ground or in a, in a cardboard box, many of them are more thankful to God than people who have a nice soft bed. We need to worship the Lord. We need to magnify God. Amen. Hello. I knew a guy that he had shag carpet. Well, that's going to take you way back a, year, a few years, wouldn't it? I may remember the shag carpet. And I had a preacher friend of mine, and he told a story about how he came home, and he's feeling ungrateful. And all of a sudden, he walked in. The Holy Ghost hit him right there as he walked into the living room, and he had shag carpet. And the Lord told him, start counting. He said, counting what? He said, counting the shag carpet. And there he crawled on that shag carpet, counting every woven piece of carpet, and going, praise the Lord. Thank God for that little curl here. Thank God for that little piece of carpet there. Thank God. And he said, it suddenly dawned on me, I didn't like that shag carpet, but now it was the most beautiful thing in my home because I was thanking the Lord. Amen. Thanking the Lord. Are you forgiven of your sin? Man, you ought to be grateful. And Chris is going to sing a song, and we're going to ask you to worship the Lord. God's not commanding you. He's inviting you to join with that wonderful host of heaven, to join in and worship God. Because while we worship God here, they worship God there. And we're part of a heavenly home. We're part of a heavenly people. Stand with me.